Hello and welcome to the California Commission on Peace Officer Standards and Training, Senate Bill 2 Workshop 3 presentation. This presentation will focus on serious misconduct, decertification investigations, and reporting obligations. My name is Darren Green and I'm a law enforcement consultant here at POST. The objective of this presentation is to provide a brief overview of Senate Bill 2 to define serious misconduct and what the agency's requirements are for reporting. I'll have a discussion on the Peace Officer Standard Accountability Division investigation and what that really entails. And then I will talk about an immediate temporary suspension and voluntary surrender of a peace officer's certification. I would like to provide a brief disclaimer for the following presentation. I am not an attorney, but I will be providing information today regarding SB2 as POST and our legal staff interprets the law. Please consult your city attorneys or county counsel for advice should you need assistance in clarifying legal matters as it pertains to language in SB2. So what is Senate Bill 2 and what's the intent behind it? It basically establishes a requirement that peace officers be certified by POST and that that certification can be suspended or revoked if the officer is engaged in serious misconduct. Not unlike your basic post certificate you had before, this certification is a requirement to practice law enforcement in California. If an officer is involved in serious misconduct and is found to be guilty of that misconduct, they could potentially be suspended for a period of up to three years or have their license revoked for life. This new bill applies to all agencies, regardless if the agency is a post-participating one or not. In order to properly handle the new responsibilities of Senate Bill 2, POST had to go out and obtain funding to add additional positions in order to meet the requirements of the bill. This has created a new division at POST called Peace Officer Standards and Accountability. This division is made up of six bureaus, four professional conduct bureaus, which essentially do the investigations of the serious misconduct. And I will get into that in a little bit later. Then there's a certification uh, bureau and an intake disposition bureau. In total, POST has acquired or is in the process of acquiring approximately 127 new positions to handle this workload. Peace Officer Standards Accountability Division, or POSAD, is made up of professional support staff as well as law enforcement consultants. The law enforcement consultants are retired peace officers from various California agencies and have vast experience in internal affairs and criminal investigations, most of them with management backgrounds. The primary responsibility of the law enforcement consultant is to review completed internal affairs cases containing allegations of serious misconduct and determine whether or not the conduct occurred and whether or not the case should be presented for decertification purposes. So how does this work? Under Senate Bill 2, agencies are required to report any allegation of serious misconduct to post, regardless of the investigative outcome. That means agencies will have to submit exonerated, sustained, not sustained, and unfounded cases to post for review. Why? As an oversight to the investigation. POSAD investigators will be looking at how thorough the investigation was, as well as determining if the officer did in fact commit serious misconduct. The reality is, it is unlikely for POST to reach a different conclusion on the department's findings because we are held at a higher investigative standard, but it is possible. More on investigative standards in a moment. OSAD has developed an internal process of review for those cases an investigator believes should be forwarded for decertification. POSAD has created an internal review panel made up of three bureau chiefs and an, an attorney who will review each case recommended for decertification. If they conclude the case should be forwarded for decertification, then the case will be scheduled for review with the Peace Officer Accountability Advisory Board. More on this in session four. It is important to understand POST is only concerned about licensing, not employment. The question comes up a lot. An officer may receive discipline by their agency for an act they committed, 
but if it falls under serious misconduct, they could face additional sanctions with their license, including suspension or revocation. It is not a double jeopardy issue. Think of it in terms of this scenario. You are a driver uh, for UPS and your driver's license gets suspended or revoked for a DUI. What does UPS management do with you? Well, you can be fired or reassigned to the warehouse. Your agency has to make the decision on hiring and firing. Post is only responsible for the licensing aspect. But if an officer has a suspended or revoked post license, they are legally unable to perform as a peace officer in California. I mentioned earlier that the evidentiary standards are different between agencies and post. Agency administrative investigations or internal affairs investigations must meet the evidentiary standard of preponderance. What is preponderance? Well, it's been described as somewhere above 50%. For decertification purposes, post investigations must meet the evidentiary standard of clear and convincing, which is much higher than preponderance. This is just an illustration of the burdens of proof standards assigned to investigations. As you can see, preponderance of evidence is just below clear and convincing, and beyond the reasonable doubt is at the top. So post falls under the clear and convincing evidence. If we cannot find clear and convincing evidence to move a case forward, the case will be closed at that point. What is serious misconduct? Well, pursuant to Penal Code Section 13.510.8, the commission was directed to adopt a definition of serious misconduct to serve as the criteria to be considered for ineligibility or for revocation of certification. In other words, the commission was tasked with creating the definition of serious misconduct, which would fall under commission regulation 1205. Penal code 13.510.8 states that the commission will adopt a definition of serious misconduct, but it must include the following, dishonesty, abuse of power, physical abuse, sexual assault, demonstrating bias, acts that violate the law that are sufficiently egregious or repeated, participation in a law enforcement gang, failure to cooperate with an investigation into potential police misconduct, and failure to intercede. Well, the commission essentially adopted this as serious misconduct and did not add any other language other than a few parts to these categories, which I will be talking about next. So we're going to be breaking down these misconduct categories and talking about how we understand them at post and how you can apply them when reporting serious misconduct. So under dishonesty, it's related to the reporting, investigation, or prosecution of a crime, or relating to the reporting of or investigation of misconduct by a peace officer or custodial officer, including but not limited to false statements, intentionally filing false police reports, tampering with, falsifying, destroying, or concealing evidence, perjury, and tampering with data recorded by a body-worn camera or other recording device for purposes of concealing misconduct. So what does this mean? Does all dishonesty cases fall under this? The answer is no. Clearly, it has to be related to the reporting of an investigation or prosecution of a crime or related to misconduct by a peace officer. So there's a lot of scenarios out there and what ifs, but you have to ask yourself, do I have to report a dishonesty case to post? You do if it falls under one of those two categories. Straight up dishonesty to a supervisor not involving misconduct investigation or reporting of an investigation or prosecution of a crime does not fit. It has to be one of those two. Abuse of power including but not limited to intimidating witnesses, knowingly obtaining a false confession, knowingly making a false arrest. Well, that certainly sounds like abuse of power, and that's pretty easy for us to figure out. But it says including but not limited to, so what else is abuse of power? Well, the list is endless, I'm sure, but this is where the agency has the ability to determine whether they believe something is an abuse of power or not. If it if it falls outside of those three bullet points, but you believe it's abuse of power, just report it to post. Physical abuse, 
it's defined as excessive or unreasonable use of force. That's it. So does it mean an officer with a sustained excessive or unreasonable use of force on their record will be decertified or have their license suspended? The answer is no. It will be entirely up to the commission to determine on a case-by-case -case basis which actions to take, if any, on those type of cases. Sexual assault. It's defined as the commission or attempted initiation of a sexual act with a member of the public on duty through force, threat, coercion, extortion, offer of leniency or other official favor, or under the color of authority. And the propositioning for or commission of any sexual act while on duty. So essentially it's saying the act doesn't even have to occur, just the propositioning of. This is the one section where the commission has added language to actually say the commission or attempted initiation of a sexual act with a member of the public or other department members. So it really applies to everybody. So essentially any on-duty sexual act, whether it's consensual or not, is considered sexual assault. Demonstrating bias through race, national origin, religion, gender identity or expression, housing status, sexual orientation, mental or physical disability, other protected status in violation of law or department policy, inconsistent with the peace officer's obligation to carry out their duties in a fair and unbiased manner. So this question comes up a lot that citizens often complain about officers taking action against them based on their race or gender identity, so on and so forth. Do I have to report this? The answer is yes. It's any allegation of serious misconduct, whether it occurred or not, has to be reported, but more on reporting when we get to it. Acts that violate the law, that are sufficiently egregious or repeated, and inconsistent with the peace officer's obligation to uphold the law or respect the rights of members of the public. So what do we have to have first for this to be a violation? Well, it has to be an act that violates the law. It doesn't necessarily mean that the officer has to be uh, convicted or arrested, just that they violated the law. So what is sufficiently egregious? Well, that's for you to determine as an agency, because everybody has different opinions of what egregious means. A lot of us say, we'll know it when we see it. But if you feel like something an officer did fits that title, then report it. Now repeated, what is an often common repeated violation of the law? within the law enforcement community, DUIs, unfortunately. If you have more than one DUI, that's considered repeated and should probably be reported to post. Participation in a law enforcement gang. First off, this is not the entire definition of this misconduct section, but for the purpose of this presentation and to keep it brief, I'm only gonna read this short segment. You can find the rest of the definition in Penal Code Section 13510.8. A group of law enforcement officers within a law enforcement agency who may identify themselves by name and may be associated with an identifying symbol, including but not limited to matching tattoos, and who engage in a pattern of on-duty behavior that intentionally violates the law or fundamental principles of professional policing. So what do you really have to have here? Well, you have to have a group of people with some sort of symbol that connects them, and they have to be engaged in a pattern of certain behaviors. Again, for more on this, you can look under Penal Code Section 13510.8. Failure to cooperate. Defined as failure to cooperate with an investigation of potential police misconduct, including an investigation conducted pursuant to Penal Code Section 13510.8, which is what we're talking about here, serious misconduct. So what does it mean? Well, it means any police misconduct, including serious misconduct. Also, the lawful exercise of rights granted under the United States Constitution, the California Constitution, or any other law shall not be considered a failure to cooperate. What does that mean? It means the officer does not have to self-incriminate himself by giving a statement. So there's some protections there for the officer. But who is this for? Well, it's not really defined, so really failure to cooperate with any investigation of police misconduct by any official 
department or investigative unit is potential. For instance, if Post had to do an additional investigation and needed to interview a witness or a subject officer in a non-criminal type interview, they could be subject to failing to cooperate if they don't give an interview. But could it apply elsewhere? We certainly think so, such as an outside agency wanting to interview an officer from another agency who was a witness to potential misconduct. Again, consult your attorneys if you want more clarity on this. And lastly, failure to intercede. Failure to intercede when present and observing another officer using force that is clearly beyond that which is necessary, as determined by an objectively reasonable officer under the circumstances, and taking into account other officers may have additional information regarding the threat posed by a subject. This one seems pretty straightforward. So this next section, we're gonna talk about Senate Bill 2's uh, reporting requirements for agencies and the timelines uh, involved. And we're gonna talk about the retroactive reporting as well and how agencies will report these to post. So what are the reporting requirements of serious misconduct? Well, to begin with, Senate Bill 2 required post to have a means in which the public can file complaints. So we've done that. Pretty much like other agencies do it, people can file a complaint online, through the telephone, through mail, or in person. But what do we do with these complaints once we receive them? Well, we forward them to the affected agency. If the agency receives a complaint from post and determines that it is in fact their agency and their officer involved in this complaint, then they have 10 days to report back to us if it involves serious misconduct. If the allegation does not involve serious misconduct as defined, then they just handle the complaint any way they normally would. If the allegation does involve serious misconduct and the agency has reported within 10 days to post, then they would go on with their normal investigation and then report back to post the outcome of whatever that investigation entailed. Beginning January 1st of 2023, Departments have 10 days to report all allegations of serious misconduct to post. Now, this is regardless of whether it's a formal investigation or not. The law just says that you have 10 days to report all allegations of serious misconduct to post. So keep in mind, we're talking about serious misconduct only, those categories we just went through. What you do with those allegations is entirely up to the department. If it becomes a formal investigation, then Post will wait until the conclusion of the internal affairs case before we take any type of action to, re to review it. If it's just a normal complaint that is handled outside of a formal investigation, you would report back to Post whenever you're concluded with that, what your outcome was. Now, the way the law is defined, it says all allegations of serious misconduct, including recommendations by a civilian oversight entity, civil judgment or court findings, or settlement of civil claim. Now, a lot of times these are associated with a formal internal affairs complaint, but not always. So if there's anything that falls under the serious misconduct category and fits in one of those categories of a civil judgment, a court finding, settlement, so on and so forth, they, they must be reported within 10 days. There's another part of this reporting requirement called the retroactive reporting. And essentially what it says is beginning January 1st of 2023, agencies have six months to report all allegations of serious misconduct dating back to January 1st of 2020. We created this graph to help illustrate the retroactive reporting. So beginning January 1st of 2023, departments have six months to report all allegations of serious misconduct, including any findings or recommendations by a civilian oversight entity, any civil judgment, or court finding or settlement of a civil claim, including formal internal affairs cases, so on and so forth. These cases are retroactive back to January 1st, 2020. So anything that occurred 
January 1st, 2020 moving forward must be reported. Now, it's interesting to understand that Post cannot take action on any of these cases, abuse of power, physical abuse, bias, acts that violate the law, law enforcement gang, failure to cooperate, failure to intercede, if the case was closed before January 1st, 2022. If the case was opened and occurred January 1st, 2020, or any time moving forward, but it was not closed until January 1st of 2022, then Post can take action. The only exception to that is if the case involved dishonesty, sexual assault, or deadly force that results in serious bodily injury or death relevant to misconduct category, not your average officer involved shooting, but a misconduct type of situation, then there is no statute of limitations on that. So if it occurred January 1st, 2020 and was, was closed that same year, but it involved one of those three categories, dishonesty, sexual assault, deadly force that results in serious bodily injury or death, Post can take action on it. So the question is, what if I have a case that falls under dishonesty, sexual assault, or deadly force that results in serious bodily injury or death, but it occurred prior to January 1st, 2020? Well, the answer is, you don't have to report it, but if you have that case and you want to report it, Post can take action on it. It seems a little silly, but we do get calls on that because there are people in possession of those cases and they want Post to take action on them. Our advice is if you have an older case that you're not required to report, but that something Post can take action on and you're going to report it, you better make sure you report all of them so you're not singling somebody out. And any case that occurred January 1st, 2022, moving forward, Post can take action on. If you're responsible within your agency for reporting serious misconduct to Post, this graph can certainly help you uh, guide the way. How are agencies reporting serious misconduct to Post? Well, I'm not gonna go into great detail because this is a specific training at a different time, but we use a platform called Mark 43. It's a record management system that was really tweaked for our use in post. They use it all over the state for many other reasons, but uh, we use it mainly for reporting and for case management. So if you're responsible for reporting, you probably already had training in this, and if not, uh, you should seek uh, training through uh, post, go to their website and sign up for this. But Mark 43 is basically a, a cloud platform where agencies can make notification on their serious misconduct allegations within the 10 days. And if need be, we can request that agencies upload documents uh, for our investigation purposes. This is just a screenshot of Mark 43 on the side where the agency would, would do their reporting. So you can see the buttons for agency misconduct. They would click on that and there's a whole slew of information that they would input. It's basically what we call a face page just for notification purposes. And the agency supplemental would be something down the road if they needed to add to it um, for the conclusion of their, their case. So I mentioned early on in the overview of this presentation that I would discuss what an immediate temporary suspension is. So to be clear, if an officer conducts misconduct and is found to be guilty of that misconduct through the process of decertification, the commission has the ability to suspend instead of revoke that person's license. And I want to make it clear that that suspension is totally separate from what I'm about to talk about. So that is an outcome of the review process of decertification where somebody could be suspended. This is different. This is written in the law that the post director, executive director shall basically suspend a person's certificate if they determine one of these factors uh, occurred that the officer was arrested or indicted for a 1029 disqualifier, 
or discharged from any law enforcement agency if the person is or has become ineligible to hold office, meaning another 1029 disqualifier, or is discharged under serious misconduct, or the officer separates from employment of a peace officer pending investigation into allegations of serious misconduct. And the executive director finds that it's the best interest of the health, safety, and the welfare of the public to do so. So what this really means is, if you have an officer who's indicted or arrested while in your department for something that could be a disqualifier, such as a felony conviction, and there's a whole list of 1029 disqualifiers, the executive director can suspend that person's cert certification so they cannot be acting as a peace officer in California until it's settled. Or if they are discharged from a law enforcement agency with the same type of conviction or arrest or under investigation for serious misconduct while they separate from the office. Why is that? Well, it's because of the theory that an officer could retire or quit in lieu of an investigation and go to another agency. Well, this prevents them from doing that. So while they're separated and under investigation for serious misconduct offense, their license will be suspended temporarily until that's settled. And that's either through the review process until they have a decision on their license or the officer just becomes disqualified under 1029 or voluntary surrender, surrenders their certification. So why would an officer voluntarily surrender their certification? Well, there's a lot of reasons, but the ability to do that is there. And if an officer doesn't want to go through the process and knows that they'll probably never be a peace officer again, they can voluntarily surrender their certification and never be a law enforcement officer again. We also see it being used with a district attorney's office in a plea agreement, such as an example where they might voluntarily surrender their certification so they don't face a felony charge, for instance. Please visit the post website if you want more reference material or to view any of the other sessions involving Senate Bill 2. Well, this concludes my presentation. If you have any more questions, please feel free to reach out to post Peace Officer Standards Accountability Division for assistance. We'll be more happy to help answer any of your questions. We've been fielding questions before January and we're filling them today and we're happy to do so. Thank you.